Okay, cue okay. slides. Here we go. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Hello. This is Jane here. This is Chris here. Um, and welcome to the 37th webinar, which has undergone a slight rebrand this week. Um, it has. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We so spent we've spent a lot of time deciding on the, uh, the, we, the layout we, and, and the font. Uh, we had to have an awful lot of branding and marketing meetings, didn't we? Um, we did. To, to get we to did. this sort of radical. Yeah. Yeah. So what we've done here, we wanted to make it clear that we're running these webinars under the auspices of the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group. So the Alt Special Interest Group, and here's the marvellous logo that Greg Walters um, has created um, that went through uh, a number of workshops and focus groups to arrive at something that we all thought was suitably Cool. Largely, um, largely to decide on the size and the position of the glasses. I think, it, it took it? us a, it took us a while, but but here we are. Now we've also uh, done a bit of uh, a, a renaming of it because we felt that uh, we wanted to move away from talking about being at a time of crisis. Um, so I think I think we can all agree that it is a time of uncertainty. I mean, we're very much going to uh, say it's not it's, the crisis is far from over. But I'm not. We felt, yes. But I think I think we've noted, you know, we, we're noting that we, we're in a different um, situation at this point mm. in this year than we were a year ago uh, when Absolutely. we were kind of right in the thick of things. But we've still get a sense that people are finding the webinars useful um, and we are actually planning on doing some uh, putting out a survey and finding out what people find useful and what their experiences have been of, of joining our uh, joining the webinars. So yeah. look out for that quite shortly. That's something that the that's being done um, as part of the the call SIG and that, that Irene, who's with us today, is going to be to be working on. So uh, welcome everybody to this one, and we're we're very much looking forward to to having. I think it's going to be a great session today, isn't it? Absolutely, Chris. Yes. So, yeah. should we have a look at what we've got lined up on the agenda? Um, Let's do that. We've, we've got our usual copyright news, plenty of news this week as ever. We always start off when we're putting this together thinking we've got one or two things, and uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's lots of news, isn't there? Some publications, some recordings from previous events. We've got a new survey out, a couple of new surveys. Yeah. And um, yeah, we and as ever, if anybody does have any other bits and bobs that we've forgotten, if they want to stick a link or something in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, we can yeah. share those. And then we've got a really great presentation from not just Teresa McKinnon, who is the co-chair of the Open Education Special Interest Group. We also have Therese and Ella from that group. So this we'll, we'll talk about more about this in a moment. But clearly, there's a very strong link between copyright, understanding copyright issues and open education more broadly. So we're we're really looking forward to to, to discussing that and, and making those links. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we're really delighted that I think we have three members of the, the other SIG with us. So uh, it would be a good chance to talk a bit about some of the issues um, about, you know, open education and where that inter intersects and overlaps with copyright and understanding copyright because I think it's you know it's an important part it's not the only part of open education but it is quite an important part so absolutely yeah. so before we get started let's talk about what we've been up to this week so um Jane you're yes. you've been spending a lot of time in your garden yeah, well, we both actually ended up with having a bit of time off, didn't we? So yeah. um, this is I thought work in progress, but this is my beautiful beach garden um, that's kind of um, inspired by um, the beach uh, sort of around here in Kent, sort of sea salt or Whitstable kind of way. So um, and the tide in my garden has got a particular it only comes in so far. So yeah, so I thought I'd show you what I've been up to and yeah. um, spent a, and a, I, a I'm... nice time dodging rain showers in my garden um, on Wednesday. Yeah, the, the summer will be here eventually, I'm sure. 
um, and then I've, I've been continuing to obsess about bread. So this is the, the most recent um, success I had with getting a relatively open crumb and a relatively good oven spring. But I did spend, I think I was up until half past midnight on Tuesday watching YouTube videos of people making sourdough bread. So I think I probably need it to. It is an take... obsession. It is, it an, is an obsession. obsession. But and there we go. It that's is a perfectly I... decent bakery that you can just buy it for. for yeah, that's three not pounds. the point. That's not <laughs> okay. So uh, there we are. That that that's that's what we've been up to. Uh, just a reminder that we do have the archive of all the uh, previous webinars, um, and that Christine is now putting these on YouTube as well. So it's uh, it should be an easier way to get access to those, and we'll be updating that page to give the links to the to the latest versions of the recordings. Are you going to pop right. that one in the chat, or am I doing that? Oh, oh, you can do that. Chat. Okay, so first up, um, this is actually um, a, a magazine that uh, came out um, actually in the, on the 19th of April. Um, we did put a blog post up about it. Um, it's called the Creative Academic Magazine. There's quite a lot about creativity in higher education. Um, but um, I just thought we hadn't actually featured this in copyright news and um, it, people might be interested. I think we put um, some of the cartoon versions of us um, in one of the previous webinars. But there is a, an article about um, how we shifted uh, copyright the card game online in that magazine. So Chris popped the link in um, and we also made a kind of little mini cartoon describing how we did it but there is actually some text so you can read if you're interested um, in our experiences of shifting uh, the card game sessions online um, that's that's the place to go so and there's loads of really other really really interesting articles in there one of my colleagues uh, Joe Payton at uh, City University um, co-edited this this edition so it's really worth um, uh, having a look at, for all sorts of different approaches to creative teaching in different disciplines yes so I guess Claire says it looks like something out of an 80s Jackie magazine. It, it does a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, we were going for that look, Claire. Definitely. We were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Was, we took a few was... of the pictures out, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we're ca carrying on with that. We'll maybe come back to it at some point. So. <laughs> OK, next up. I think this is me as well, isn't it? The next one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, the um, the OER by Domains conference, which was at the end of April, um, this uh, the recordings um, are available um, now in a kind of fabulous interactive um, online guide. Um, for anyone who didn't know about the conference, we presented um, at this conference um, on the relationship between copyright literacy and open practices, and um, they had this really great sort of um, way of laying out the program to make it look a bit like a sort of retro TV guide. It's really good actually for participants to be able to navigate between uh, sessions and they've got loads of recordings up. So um, a couple of things, I guess, other than our session, which actually wasn't recorded because it was a sort of uh, a live um, chat session that we did on a, a, a platform called Discord. Um, but what I would really recommend is that you watch some of the keynotes and um, the keynote that Rajiv uh, Janjiani, I think that's how you say his name, um, he's a, a, a Canadian open education um, expert and that's it's an absolutely fantastic keynote. So um, some, some, yeah, really good recordings there though and loads of stuff to explore. I have to say that his keynote was it was the most like being in a room with people just going wow this is incredible that i've that i've experienced since we all went online so it's definitely worth catching up with and it'll be really but very relevant to what we're talking about today yeah definitely so the next thing is for those of you who joined us last time round, we had an update from uh, colleagues in australia uh, and this is um recordings from an event they put on in that uh, previous week from the Australian Digital Alliance Virtual Copyright Forum. So there's some excellent uh, presentations, recordings of presentations in there, um, including uh, from Dr. Emily Hudson, 
a member of this parish who I think is with us today. Yes, I can see you on the list. So definitely worth checking out if you want to get into some of the detail of what's happening happening in Australia and hearing from, from some others as well. Um, so uh, just going back, I think the recordings from the OER by Domains are on that site. I think if you go into the guide, then you should be able to get access to the YouTube recordings of those. Mm. If not, if yes, yes, or and on Alt's YouTube channel, so you should be able to find all of those things. They definitely take an open approach to to that content for obvious reasons. Um, okay, so that's the Australian stuff. We also wanted to highlight this Spark Europe Open Education Survey, which is looking at libraries and higher education institutions and uh, what their practices and policies are around open education. So again very relevant to the theme of today's this is and this webinar. is a, an annual survey as well isn't it mm -hmm. i think it's something where spark have done this they've now got a european network of open education librarians that was created i think sometime last year um but they're running this survey to look at sort of open education practices and how they've been supported um and it is sort of building on a lot of the work that unesco did in this area as well a few years ago so yeah Next survey. So this survey uh, is from Communia um, and um, they are a sort of, uh, well, they came out of a European project, but they're a sort of um, advocacy organisation for um, copyright reform and uh, sort of other freedoms related to the Internet. Now, just to say that this survey and I have clarified this with them because I tweeted a bit about it. They are looking for school teachers to fill this in. So we know lots of you listening are not school teachers, but they are um, struggling a bit to get um, teachers in the UK. UK to fill it in. They've been running the survey in about eight different countries around Europe and they would really like more evidence from UK teachers. So if you do have any ways of being able to reach um, teachers, um, then can we encourage you to think about how you might share it? And just some feedback. I mean, I, I know I, I had some um, from people saying, you know, that, that teachers are obviously really, really stressed at the moment. Um, but I did check and they, they don't want librarians to fill this in. It is a survey where they want to get the experiences of teachers. But we just thought maybe our network might be able to help. So that's the Absolutely. community survey. So the final item. Last but not least on uh, copyright news this week is that the call for contributions for <laughs> iPod closes on Monday. We need Monday. a theme tune. We need, we need a theme tune. Okay, we need a theme right. tune. All right. Well, we'll get working on the theme tune. You've got uh, till the 25th of June. Otherwise, you know, I'm going I actually, to sing a theme tune. I actually dreamt a song last night and I woke up and it, it was terrible because, of course, in the dream, it's brilliant. But, You're um, not Paul uh, McCartney. You're just not. It's well, I'm, I'm not Paul McCartney. Anyway, that <laughs> is beside the point. The point is that Ice Pops is shaping up to be excellent. We have had yeah. contributions. There is space for more contributions. Um, and I think we would be, yeah, we, we, we're really looking forward to, to still keeping the Ice Pops flame alive, if that's not mixing two metaphors too much. Um, <laughs> with this event at the end of June. So don't want to melt that lolly, do you? Don't, don't, don't burn the flame too, too close to an ice an icy lolly. Absolutely lolly-ish. don't like no. a, like a, a, a we're not going to get a moth in, involved Candle in the, in the wind. Flame. No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we right. like a metaphor, I think, don't we? Yeah. I think is this is where we draw a line under under this particular uh piece of verbal diarrhea. Ridiculousness. And just say please um if we can put the link in the chat, please consider putting something in um, if you have a creative approach to copyright literacy or copyright education. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so. That was copyright news. <laughs> uh, without further ado, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker for today. I think, we, as I say, we have got, um, uh, Teresa McKinnon, who's the co-chair of the Alt Open Education Special Interest Group, but we also have Therese Bird and I think we have Ella Mitchell as well, who are both members of the, the Special Interest Group as well. We're going to hand over 
to them. I know they do have some slides at one point, but I think um, am I handing over to you, Teresa, to start with? Um, and I think you're going to share your screen and um, chat to us. So, but really pleased you can join us. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much. And it's great to be with you all and to uh, see a very impressive long list of participants. So big welcome and thank you for having us popping into your community. But hopefully you're already part of our community as well, the wider open education community. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and give you a little bit of a tour. And Elizabeth, lovely to see you. Uh, and uh, show you, th and this is something you can quite easily do by picking, um, there we go, hopefully my sheet, my screen is now shared, yep. Are you seeing my screen? Uh, I'm Looks seeing like a, a white. white. I'm just seeing yeah, a white. Hang on, hang on. White. Sorry, sorry. Click wrong button. Looks like there we a, go. Is... There we go. Ah, that's it. <laughs> Great. Yeah, working okay. now. So using a, a search engine of your choice, if you put open ed SIG and possibly the letters ALT into a search engine, you will find us. Yeah. So we have a community space online which is supported by the Association for Learning Technology who kindly um, supply, supply and provide the technology for this particular SIG. Um, You've said co-chair. We've got quite a flat structure, I have to say, within, within our um, Open Ed SIG community. I I take the role of chair at the moment because um, the other people are not available. We just sort of share between ourselves the the jobs that have to be done. And um, I'm really happy as well that you're going to hear from uh, two other committee members. We actually have a very small committee of people. Um, and and they're all people in slightly different roles, but the people who um, are interested in and wish to support or actively um, advocate and support within their institutions, um, open education. The mission of the SIG really is to support, develop, sustain and influence policy in open education. Um, so what we try to do um, as a SIG is to bring together um, research and practice uh, and foster dialogue between organisations and individuals who are engaged in education. The aim really is to provide a safe space for discussion. Um, and really, we, we try and do that through regular webinars where we focus on a particular aspect of open education. Um, so just uh, to give you a quick um, insight and some of the things we've done recently. Obviously, we, we do quite a lot of the uh, connections to uh, the open education or the OER conferences, the series of conferences that Alt have supported um, for some years now. Um, so we're very much involved in helping to support and deliver those conferences. So the recent OER by Domains 21 conference. Um, you see many of our um, community involved in that. Um, open badges, open data, um, all of these communities, open source. Uh, you can see as well recordings here, links to the blog posts here. So as you as you wander through this site, you will be able to find very quickly the various aspects of uh, dialogues and discussions that we've had over the years. We're also very keen to support and recognize networks which are engaged in open practice. So our own um, contribution to this year's OER conference was in the form of uh, a discussion around the work of Bring Your Own Device for Learning, the BYOD for L community and the work that they've done and uh, to broaden that conversation out to where should they go next and how should they implement it. Um, and we had a really lively um, um, discussion there that was very helpful. We're a very friendly community. We are literally open. You don't have to be a member of Alt to, to participate. Um, and if we go to the home page here, you can see the uh, various spaces that we have and the forums and the um, blog posts that we do. And we do now have our own um, 
let's just give you a link to this in the chat as well. We do, of course, have our own um, Twitter channel. But we're very much needing um, additional input within our um, um, SIG. So if this is an area that actively is of interest for you, we're certainly looking for new members of our committees. Um, you can see our current committee um, posts here, a little bit of information about them. And we're currently in the process as well of um, creating uh, a flip grid with some personal comments from members to enable you to get to know them better. Cats are also welcome. I'll just move my cat out of the way so I can see my screen. Um, blog posts tend to be on, on sort of community issues. Um, so a focus on uh, particular aspects of open, and that includes um, FEMED tech uh, and uh, accessibility and um, some of the bigger barriers that people experience to education and learning. Um, posts around uh, this recent one there, a uh, discussion around open badges as well. Uh, but we always welcome people who wish to post to our wider community and get conversations uh, started. So do engage with our GISC mail list if you wish to do that, and we can make that happen. I know as well we've got lots of people here who are um, experts in particular aspects of open education, or perhaps your main focus is on OERs, for example. Well, do take a look and check our past webinars because you'll see there that we've had conversations recently around open COVID for ed um, and how we can help people find their open voice if you like because we know open practice can be contextual it's very personal it's not um, necessarily a, a straight line if you you know if you champion open education you don't necessarily make everything you do open um, so we have those sorts of discussions around the nuances of open practice uh, and you'll find these recorded and you'll also find them on the old channel under the open education SIG um, playlist um, so discussions here around values we had that discussion back in 2017 where we had um, Martin de Giamis, amongst others talking to us around um, what is behind Moodle for example and what values they hold um, and hard discussions around uh, you know the role of open educational resources in inclusive practice what we do is aim to provide um, as I say, a safe space for these sorts of discussions. Um, and within that safe space, of course, that means that at some come the old winter conference or Christmas time, we generally tend to have a, a sort of um, online webinar where we just get together and uh, do daft things together just to recover from <laughs> the day job. So I'm going to jump back out now because I know uh, Therese has some sh her slides to share, so I'll stop my sharing. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat and uh, I will do my best to uh, respond to them. But please be reassured that, you know, the community of open education, which covers a broad um, range of topics, is very much a friendly community we welcome your queries and contributions whatever your role whether whether you're a practitioner a librarian um, retired like me whatever role you find yourselves in we we are open to discussion and that's what we're here for I'm going to pass the mic over to Therese now thanks so much Teresa it's uh it's so nice to be reminded of all the cool stuff that's been going on <clears throat> and it's great to meet uh, this SIG, um, this is my first time joining one of these um, webinars, so thanks so much. So I'm the educational designer for Leicester Medical School, and um, part of open education is um, um, learning, learning that is co-created by students, and that's, um, you know, that has its uh, kind of fraught aspects. Um, and so uh, fraught aspects of working together with students, but also copyright related issues. So in a way, I'm just sort of um, sharing some of the issues that 
that I've discovered, um, and not just because of COVID, but it, it got, kind of got heightened with COVID. And so I'd, I hope this gets some conversation going. And I would like to get some ideas from you guys from this community about um, you know, how we could possibly handle some of this going forward. So um, I'm just going to share about the, um, OK. So I look after the medical students. And this medical students are insanely busy, as well as being insanely uh, competitive and um, insanely ambitious and all these things. And so in the middle of you know learning to be a doctor, they do things like create apps, make all make you know 3D models of the brain, and you know they're this this is what it's like uh, looking after <laughs> looking after med med students. And um, so a few years ago, I um, met with a student. He was in year two, and he couldn't find a. Um, an anatomy text that he liked. He wanted it to be online and hyperlinked. So because he couldn't find one, he started making his own. And it's called Teach Me Anatomy. Um, he, <laughs> he started making it online with WordPress. And it just mushroomed into this well-used online um, resource. Um, because he was able to kind of get some traction in the United States, he um, got, he was able to start advertising to American doctors who pay a lot of money to see advert, uh, uh, adverts about pharmaceuticals. And that was how he got an income from this. So he could roll the money back into the project. And um, then he, you know, he was able to do anatomy, surgery, physiology, ob pediatrics. Um, and it became so good and it's so international internationally vetted that it is good enough to use as an anatomy text and we now use it as our anatomy text okay now um in, it was oer 15 i think that i brought along this chappie to uh the oer conference and we presented together on this project and um uh, since then, he's he's a doctor in Cambridge. He's going on with his life, but he's still looking after the project. He's got lots of people looking after it, and he learned from OER to you know make sure that any images that he uses are allowed to be used. Uh, so he's you know he's he knows about Creative Commons, etc. And he's learned how to um, uh, you know kind of draw his own out of print. Gray's Anatomy is where everything started um, with this with this textbook. Well, um, it's not exactly an open, it's not an OER because it's open-ish, I would say, um, because it used to be funded by adverts. Now he has decided to charge for it if you're not um, in Leicester. <laughs> so that's how he does it. So he puts the fancy stuff where you, uh, you know, you have like a premium model, you know, and in, in a way, I'm just sharing that this is how uh, an ambitious student actually helps other students really uh, with this material. But you know, it does cost money and how do you keep it going? And so this is how he's doing it. So, you know, to colleagues in Leicester, it's free, but to other people to get the really fancy stuff, he'll charge a little bit of money. So that's just showing you, um, it's, you know, I consider it kind of open, open-ish, but it's not exactly open. Now, some of our other students, um, so here's another student. He just made a Wix website and he's sharing out all of his notes to other students and he's so ambitious he's got his own youtube channel already it's going strong and um he shared out everything to help the students to pass the exams and right now it's it's exam um uh exam time so students are all on youtube and on his website and they're just saying thank you so much thank you and um you know, there's a part of me that I, I think it's great, but I, I, I start to get a little bit nervous. And now, and here's another story, which I'm going to tell you, but I'm not going to, I've got no slide for this. Um, a couple of additional students have now kind of gotten this bug of creating platforms. Um, so we've got another student who has created an online platform that shares out all of the students notes that they've written kind of digested of the Lester curriculum 
and they're sharing it out to the world. Um, and he's, I, I, he, he's kind of, it's a little money spinner for him in some way. I don't know how. Um, and there's a, so our staff and we're all a little bit struggling with this because we had to have a discussion with the student that, okay, there is such a thing as intellectual property. And um, the more you share about uh, the course, um, you know, our staff are being paid to write that course. It's their intellectual property. It also belongs to the university. And it's not exactly kosher to be sharing it out to the entire world. <laughs> and so we kind of had to have to keep going back and forth about that. Um, so that's, and there's, there's another case of, um, uh, of a student who's created a, uh, a platform which sort of um, shares out all the different student societies in medicine, but now it's sort of like a gateway, a gatekeep. It, uh, his site is sort of like the gatekeeper site. And so people aren't quite sure if they're happy about that. I mean, there's created functionality, but um, it's a little bit of control that's being imposed. So these are some, yeah, I see some comments, uh, nuanced discussions uh, to be had about this. So we're basically experienced, it's, it's great to create things with students. Students, you know, not only are they the, their peers, they know what it's like to learn this stuff. Let me show you something that's been created by one of our students. So we're using this right now. Um, this is a little module in Top Hat. We're using this for preclinical. And um, I don't know if you could see it. It's, I'm sorry, it's not that great. But you can see there's, um, it's explaining how to do a cardiovascular exam. So you've got the video, you've got the checklist, and then you've got some questions. And because this is done in uh, Top Hat, um, you, you, know, you can ask me about that if you're interested in that software. Um, the students can answer the questions and it's collected in a portal how they did on these quizzes, how they, how they answered. And yes, we've had higher year students create these for the lower year students. Students are, they know how it feels to not understand the topic they use you know, they use language that each other can understand. They, um, they have the energy. They sometimes make the videos look like TikTok, so it's more, more, kind of more fun. So it's great to work with students to create uh, materials, but you do have these issues that arise. So, you know, students kind of, they're so excited and ambitious, they don't understand about intellectual property you have, or copyright, you have to talk to them about it. Um, also, they might not be cor uh, correct. Students, you know, have to, uh, staff would need to check this stuff over. Um, but if it's initiated by the students, the staff sort of start to resent it because, you know, we've got enough to do than to help you with your new app. Um, so, um, but it's great for the students to do this because they're teaching and creating. So, you know, nobody wants to shut them down because they really are learning from this. So, so that's actually, um, that's my situation. <laughs> and I wonder if anyone else uh, has come across these sorts of things or if anybody has, um, you know, in the end, I would like to kind of come up with a bit of a framework for working together with students in an open way. Um, and I just wonder if, the, if, if there's any suggestions out there, if anybody else has considered these kinds of issues. Therese, I definitely have had experiences. I mean, we're looking at this at Kent, and I think this is something it will be useful to come back to at the end if we've, mm. we've got some time for a sort of broader discussion of all the issues. But I think that that thing that you've pointed out here between different perceptions of what is acceptable behavior and what isn't, and that whole conceptualization of intellectual property is going to be quite different from a student, from an academic, from a from a university or education manager's perspective. So I think mm. it would be really, yes, really good to, to get, get other people's um, experiences on that. But yeah, that, that, but that really makes sense to me. So thank you very mm. much. Um, were you going to hand over to Ella? Was she going to say something or did we want to throw it over to discussion at this stage? I am happy to hand over to Ella. Um, 
I'm, I was, I was, I'm a little bit unclear if uh, <laughs> where we were going next. But, <laughs> but, but that's it for me on this. So thank, thanks, guys. <laughs> no, Therese, I think, I think you, you know, it's, it's really that you picked this up at the end as well, um, because I think it relates directly to some of the issues we've been discussing on the list copy seeker, our mailing list as well about you know, student created content and the kind of ethics of, you know, obviously encouraging students to be creative and to do this, but some of the concerns there might be when students are, um, as you say, sort of taking uh, resources created by their teacher and then potentially putting them on other platforms where, you know, it's an, it's, 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 it's copyright infringement and it's it's also kind of you know usually against the the rules and regs that they signed up to as a student you know which says that these are teaching materials for your own private non-commercial research not not for you to pop on a platform and try and make some mm. money out of but i you know it's kind of how we get that balance right and explain mm. that to students about what is open and what is kind of more closed and 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 I think some of this so often comes from students just not understanding copyright on on a lot of levels mm. they do always rewrite it so it's never a simple cut and paste as far as I know yeah um, okay and yet there is intellectual property in even in the outline of things and you know how the curriculum is laid out and you know so it's there's a nuance there so yeah. <laughs> and I would say that it's a nuance where um, intellectual property policies at universities don't always help. They, they don't, they no, don't true, help by, by actually making it clear. Uh, and I think there's an awful a lot of the reason for that is because um, there's so much focus on outputs from research that can be commercialized. That's why really universities were incentivized to get on top of intellectual property and, and have positions on it. So that's clearly attention here with open education because it's not necessarily on the radar at most educational institutions as a thing that needs to be thought about holistically in conjunction with all those other issues and 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 from my perspective when these kinds of issues get raised a student is doing something and they're sharing it on the internet it, it's sort of well is have they broken the rules this is a compliance issue rather than a okay let's think more holistically about how how we want to support openness in some contexts and yes. not in others and 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 involving involving all those the students and the staff and others in a conversation about what what we want th practice to look like um yeah. and and policy the supporting practice at this point yeah it's great to see leo's here actually in in uh, uh, collection of participants and and he has some really great um, insights into this sort of area this policy area which where it's always tricky but it, it, what i what i would point to and this is something that comes up time and time again in the open um, education community is that we are encouraged to put people in boxes we're encouraged to um, put students in a box and say students must do X and must not do Y um, and in fact those students are with you maybe for three four or five years they're going to go on being learners we hope having got a passion for learning within their um, HEI um, and they need to understand how to operate more broadly and increasingly they're doing that digitally so we need to be part of that education process not just for students actually for staff as well who also find this very thorny but things like the practice of using creative commons licensing and understanding how it works that, that that's built upon copyright and an understanding of copyright so there are lots of things we could be doing already if you're aware of the creative commons um, certificates uh, they're available the content is downloadable you can put them on your moodle you can make self-access courses already um, so I think there are lots of things we could be doing already to actually help foster that dialogue and make sure that people feel valued you know even such things as using creative commons licenses on your practitioner materials so it's absolutely clear what can be used and in what way um, those resources can be used um, so yes please please do um, get in touch and be part of that conversation that we're having. It's not a matter of open versus closed. It's very much a continuum. 
Um, and we're getting great work here from Catherine Cronin and many others, um, but certainly in, in Ireland we're seeing um, some leading think thinkers on um, open practice and how we can better understand it. Yes, um, if I could come in here, Rosa. Yeah, just um, uh, there's a couple of questions. I think um, Emily Hudson's been asking um, about um, getting students involved in um, creating content for her course. I, I don't know, Emily, if you're if you want to speak or if you 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 just want um, a response to the question. Um, I popped something in the chat about the Raise Network, which is a student engagement network. Um, it's kind of crossing into a slightly different you kind of you know you've got areas about teaching students about copyright and plagiarism and all those kinds of issues which many librarians are involved in but there is a wider network um, of projects which were very much about a student-led um, curriculum and um, getting students involved in in kind of the creation of materials. I went to the RAISE conference a couple of years ago when I worked on a student engagement project so that's definitely something to look at um, but your question specifically is um, a concern about students plagiarising content from materials such as things like lecture transcripts and um, you know whether everything then has to go through turn it in and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to pick up uh, Theresa, uh, Ella, if anyone wants to say anything about that. I mean, obviously, it's a kind of key area. Librarians teach a lot about yeah, I plagiarism. I would certainly deal with that. Sorry, this is Theresa, by the way. I would certainly deal with that. It's very much an assessment design issue um, that, you know, you can you know, you can design assessments that are not easily plagiarised. Um, and there needs to be, there's there's not enough assessment literacy generally within our, our staff populations. And we need to have those discussions. Um, you know, what makes a good um, design? What makes a good assessment? Emily, um, you've got your hand up. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah yes. Um, hope you can hear me now. We can, yes. I, I, I think that the, the thing for us is that it's not that the entire answer is plagiarised, but if you're talking about a law assessment where students are required to describe what was said in the cases as part of their assessment, they end up pastiching descriptions from here, there and everywhere. So it's actually, I'd be very keen to, to hear more about assessment designs that don't have that problem. Because I actually, I'm, I, I have a feeling there just comes a point at which if you're getting students to, as I said, to, to engage with, in our instance, legal materials, there is just so much scope for them to plagiarise things. And that, as I said, it's not entire huge chunks of text. It's bits and pieces being drawn together, together from everywhere. Um, and we're doing a lot to try and train students in good academic practice and writing and so on and so forth. But I've got lots of colleagues who want to be back in exam rooms with students doing invigilated exams because we're just really like, we can't find a good answer to this at the moment. Um, um, and I certainly don't, and I don't think the college wants to go through down the route of like a proctoring and having students spied on through their webcams. So. It was just, right. it's just something which we are really concerned about in relation to academic integrity. Um, it's so just a huge sort of, issue, it's a, Emily. It's an yeah. issue which draws on, the, on, on this aspect of student creative materials, but sort of also some of the materials we're creating as well. So it's a broader issue. I think one of the things that we certainly had to do was to look at an assessment criteria. So because obviously you haven't got, you know, got equivalent in a way of an open book exam, so what are you what are you giving credit for? Are you looking for citations? Are you looking for analysis? Um, you know, it's, it, it really comes down to the the practitioners themselves analyzing what they're assessing and how they're assessing. Um, and in many cases, certainly in languages, it meant throwing out our usual assessment criteria up to a point and, and actually redesigning. Um, and I appreciate that's not somebody, something anybody wants to do at a point when, you know, we're in COVID and we're trying to deal with so many other things. But collectively, across professional organisations, it is something that can happen. 
Um, it, you know, we do tend to be stuck in our silos, so we're trying to find answers within our organisation or within our discipline, and sometimes we need to look across disciplines, which is really what the Open Ed SIG is all about, connecting those discussions in different places, internationally and also in terms of uh, different institutions. And I think just to come in on this, I, I think a key area where the, we've been talking about this, that there is perhaps a, a lack of nuance and understanding is the intellectual property and is the copyright side of things. I pick up on 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 what we've got on screen from um, uh, Therese's slide here about stealing intellectual property from the teacher. Um, I mean, I would I would I would take a, a fairly pedantic thing about the stealing versus infringing of intellectual property because intellectual property isn't actual real property that you could steal, but it's something that people that's what they talk about. And I think when we're talking about copyright for me copyright is a tool that can be used to do certain things in certain contexts and if we see plagiarism and uh, cheating on exams or contract cheating as a, a copyright issue we miss the point really because it, it, it's an important factor in a broader discussion about what are acceptable behaviors mm. and I think that's where the challenge comes because you need lots of different people with different levels of expertise and, and, and to, to come together to, to work out how we deal with these and how we avoid tying ourselves in knots about what a you know, particular license says or, or what copyright laws or who owns what. That's important to work out as a fundamental thing, but if we get stuck and bogged down in that, we, we're moving away from from a, a broader discussion about how we we want to allow learning and teaching to take place how we want to encourage students to to think creatively and work creatively so i think that's 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 the challenge uh, really that the, the at the moment my experience is we, we we've raised this issue it's come up in relation to contract cheating or and and course hero and stu docu and those sites and and i'm trying to reframe this within Kent as a let's think about openness let's think about those questions more broadly rather than there's a problem people are breaking the rules and let's find a way to, to clamp down on it because there's so much nuance in there so I guess the, the question I wanted to, to come back to to uh, members of, of, of Teresa Therese and, 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 and Ella and anyone else really who's involved in in openness here is have you got experiences of bringing the, that understanding what we would deter we, we, we call copyright literacy about ethical <laughs> you know uh, knowledges knowledge skills and behaviors bringing it back into that openness space and talking about how it fits in with policy and how it fits in with practice these kind of situations that I've described um, have led to some really really good discussions um, amongst staff and students together. So for that, I am really thankful. Um, it's given me a chance to give some quick teaching about uh, Creative Commons, um, you know, in, in Im imaging and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it, it, it has opened the door to some good. Um, it's just that as time goes on, new incarnations of these issues develop and we kind of, it basically just forces us to keep keep discussing it, which I think is a good thing. Thanks, thanks for that. And I think this is something yeah. where it may be that, you know, obviously we're having this discussion now, but um, we might be able as as the uh, the call SIG to be able to bring some of that expertise around copyright and looking at how, how we are looking in our institutions at that question um, to try to, to, to move things forward. So but I, I think I think actually, Chris, this is kind of also why for we we we've been writing, haven't we, about copyright literacy and how it relates to other literacies, whether you want to call it information, digital, academic literacy. And I think this is actually a really clear area where it is overlapping massively with questions about ethics and how you communicate and share and kind of what it means within a discipline to use evidence from other sources and kind of explaining that 
to students because I think, you know, in law, they, they will need to use case law as evidence, um, as you know, and, and I, I can see why the temptation might be to just be, you know, they're looking for the model answer to kind of follow. Where's the case law? Just put that in. And, and, and if that's not what, you know, you want lawyers to do in the future, if you do want them to do something more than that, then you have to think about designing an assessment that perhaps you know in, involves i don't know an element of their own reflections and and things where you know you can't plagiarize i mean none of the assessments that are on my modules really would be able to be plagiarized because of the kind of the the requirement for anyone who's doing any of my assessments to include that level of what does this mean for me and my practice and that element of reflection so it would be you know i don't want a theoretical essay because I want people to be reflective practitioners. I'm kind uh, of going think, off on one a bit, but you know, yeah, well, is, I think, is, I think is that it relevant? Links, I think it does. It links to just seeing Leo's comment about how, and, and following on from what Therese said, is that this needs to be discussed and negotiated, all, all of these questions discussed and negotiated rather than thinking they're going to be solved. And that actually makes me reflect on the conversation that I had with, with colleagues or with a colleague a couple of weeks back. And I was talking about one of the, the tricky copyright questions that we as a community deal with all the time. And I was saying, and, and I use, I think I used the word resolution. Now, how can we resolve this? And the thing is, well, you, you can't, I mean, this is life. You don't resolve life. The only point which you resolve it is the point that it's over. And I think it's just keeping all of those points together and keeping the right people in touch with each other and trying to try frame the conversation in the right way um, mm. because otherwise mm. you try to lock down something and, and the world is changing all the time isn't it mm. I love that point Chris you can't resolve life the only point <laughs> at which life gets resolved is when there is no life left and surely that's not what we want <laughs> Definitely not. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask a question actually um, Teresa as just I'd really like to sort of jump in here about um, involvement um, in your community because in, in the in the library community there's a huge open access um, community people who work in this area um, you know of, of, of kind of helping and supporting researchers of looking after this kind of uh, funding that's available through um, you know APCs and things like that um, and advising about what research um, you know, funding councils want. And I'm just wondering, you know, it, it always feels to me like that the, uh, the open education community really would benefit from having more of these people involved. And does that, you know, uh, is that something, you know, that, that you think, you mentioned open data, that seems, and the open textbook issues, those seem like really important issues where we, we really do need to get library community engaged much more in your SIG as well, rather than just having those conversations about it more from that kind of, um, you know, how do we support researchers to understand, you know, the, the, the kind of open access for publishing? I'm going to, I'm going to come back on pronouns. There is no my community. There is no, this is not a community that I um, in charge of <laughs> this is just mm -hmm. I am one of many people who um, are active in the open education community and all of those people who are active in terms of librarians or um, people involved in OER are of course part of our community we mm. you know we wouldn't have it in, have it any other way so there is there are no barriers it is totally open and if we need discussions, which clearly we do, perhaps around assessment, particularly as we come out of COVID, we, you know, our focus has been very much on actually supporting people mentally through the whole COVID process and, and showing just how the inequalities that have been often hidden within our societies have become very obvious and very big um, during COVID. We've been focusing on that, hence the um, open COVID for Ed pledge. Um, but, you know, as we come out of this phase, we need to have deeper discussions around things such as the ebook SOS movement. You couldn't have timed that better, Leo, because that reminds me of that whole discussion. 
And yeah, if you're yeah. already involved in it, we will host a webinar for those discussions. That's really what we're here for. So mm. the, the committee really wants to provide those safe spaces for those discussions. And as Chris said, we won't resolve them, but we will facilitate the discussion and we will hopefully mm. move things forward. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is just a shared ongoing activity. Um, yeah. You know, it's only when you meet those, and Therese has provided beautiful illustration of those practical issues. When we meet those thorny issues, we're then able to sort of open up for discussion if people feel safe to have those discussions. So that's yeah. very much what yeah. we're here for. And, you know, don't feel you have to join anything in particular, just, you know, follow us on Twitter, join the conversation in the JISC. Um, and as I say, we, as, a, as a very small committee, all we try to do is to catalyze those discussions. No, thank, thank you. Thanks for that clarification as well, because I, I totally didn't mean that yours was some sort, it was your community and it was a kind of separate thing. I didn't mean it like that. It kind of, yeah, it was my inarticulate Friday morning. Um, no worries. Ramble. No worries. It's, 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 Chris. Talking to a linguist is the issue there. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I think what we've what we've explored here are some really sort of fundamentally important points about um you know clearly an overview of what your group is doing um and the sorts of issues that you talk about. And and we know that there are the links there between openness and copyright. And if I can get Jane to drop a link into Greg Walter's blog post which was summing up from the OER session would be useful because there we talk oh, yes, about the do. fact that copyright and licensing is one part of the openness discussion maybe you could mute your mic as well while you type would be uh, thank would you, be nice. thank uh, you. Just, just a thought um, but I think what we've seen here is there's a very strong link in in terms of intent of what we're trying to do with our, with our relevant special interest groups we're trying to get away from binary concepts open versus closed um, and similarly with copyright, we often have right versus wrong, and we have this issue with risk management being a key part of it. Um, so I think it's, this is a, a beginning of a beautiful relationship, I would say. Um, so uh, and also to say this, this I think lays the ground for the next um, session that we have uh, in in our in our schedule, where we have the the, the US team that are looking at. Uh, uh, codes of best practice in use of, of copyright material in open educational resources. Uh, but I just want to say thank you so much to um, Teresa, Therese um, and Ella, sorry you couldn't get your mic to work, but thank you for introducing your work. I know it'll be, it's a lot of interest to a lot of people on the call and we'll definitely be looking at opportunities to see where we can feed into each other's work. Thank you, thanks Chris and Jane for having us. It's been I meet you all as well and you know I just want to see that just um, mail OE SIG um, listserv grow and our Twitter followers grow so that we can really widen out these discussions and you know bring us the issues you know where are you having the problems so that we can um, sort of distill those and get get a relevant uh, sort of leaders of discussion to together absolutely um and Teresa, just we'd really like to see you um and and if you could help advertise the session we're doing on the 11th of june i think the the codes of best practice the work that's been done um in the us um around fair use the one on open educational resources is a massively overlapping area of interest for both our groups so um and i think after that session um, it would be really good to pick up a conversation about where we go with this in the UK because they're very keen because it's about open educational resources. The team who've developed it have already got a kind of Canadian slant on it. So how um, the code work under a fair dealing um, Canadian law. And we would like to do something about the UK as well. So um, I think we'd really like to pick that up with you um, if that's uh, if that's something your group's interested in. Absolutely. Very, very. Yeah. Uh very happy to co-promote and uh, yeah to widen those discussions too one of the biggest issues i suppose really we have with with copyright is the um, the fact that it is national it's applied at a national level and obviously these things 
um, make, make differences to the practitioner. Um, the work I did in this area was actually collaborating with someone in Australia, as, and it, and it's you know, it's interesting to get those different perspectives. And thanks, Leo. The Open Ed SIG list is the one that you're looking for. Oh, we yeah, are just that in that the there too, yeah. Yeah, that's another list, but I've just pop popped it in there because I saw Sally's message. So it's called the Open Ed SIG. So that I've just put the link to the GIST mail list, which actually I only signed up to myself last week. Um, but um, it, it was a, a good reminder, actually, that we think we're kind of all joined up and we're talking to each other. And actually, I've Im immediately picked up on some really interesting discussions happening on your list. So, um, OK, it's 12 o'clock. Chris, yeah, but thank you for joining us. Um, Chris, we've just got a couple of quick things, haven't we, to run through? Um, yes, yes. Uh, just to say that we are, we've talked about the next session on, on the 11th. Um, we, we, we're we looking for suggestions of future topics. We know there's been discussions about what we do for the next academic year, and clearly we, we've had a lot of um, there's been a lot of focus on the CLA's license extension, uh, which comes to an end at the end of July. Um, so uh, the, the, you know, the CLA and their members do not plan to extend that. That was the agreement that they reached. Um, CNAC have been talking to CLA uh, about uh, where where that leaves us, um, and I think this is if there would if there's interest in talking about that specifically or more broadly, how we are looking ahead to 21 22 and getting together online resources resources as we move out of the pandemic i get the sense there is some interest in talking about that mm, then mm, you know i think mm. what we'll, we'll probably do is get ideas from people on copy seek on this to see what they want to talk about but uh, we're going to have a break for so it's it's going to be three weeks till the next webinar so we don't have one um on the 4th of june um so just just to kind of let you know our next one will be the 11th of june um we have also been talking to creative commons about an issue related to images um and um sort of the, the various trolling. yes yes um so that's another topic that we're hoping to organize a webinar probably in july um about but we'll post on list, list copy seek about that one won't we yeah. i think yeah and we've also been talking to Emily about putting on another event or so, so that, that's we've got some ideas in the pipeline yes. we're working yes, on yes, something yes. Um, and also I, just to pick up on the fact that I know Emily you've, you've put quite a, a chunky question uh, that we didn't really get a chance to look at I think it may be that this whole area of discussion we, we might want to return to not necessarily as a full webinar but as part of the cross working between between the two groups but um, there's, there is lots in the pipeline uh, definitely more to come yeah. Anyway, we're going to leave people with one last thing because it's there's a really exciting thing coming up this weekend, isn't there? There's something date for your diary things. Yes, that... absolutely. I'm sure everyone will be spending their Saturday night eagerly writing their contribution to the Alt C um, annual conference, weren't they? Yes, yes, yes. I think people thought you were going to say something else, Chris, on Saturday yeah, about Saturday well. night, but uh, I, I've I've certainly got something. I'm trying to frantically finish, hopefully by the end of today, actually, um, for the conference. But yeah, the old conference, 7th to the 9th of September. Um, and, and there we go. <laughs> <laughs> but Saturday night is, of course, Eurovision. So, so we, yeah, we had that. We did this last year, didn't we? Um, we did. We, we did, did consider trying to do a rich short rendition for those of you that hung around at the end. Of yeah, making we your mind up. Sing. Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to put that skirt on that you can whip off. So, we, but... we might have to, uh, I think Ice Pops, we'll, we would definitely a musical um, include then. So, oh, or, well, we're or, doing karaoke in the evening. We are doing we? karaoke, yeah. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so okay, there we let's go. stop the recording now, I think, and um, we'll uh, uh, leave you all there.